Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is Sell Different with my friend, Lee Sauls. How's it going, Lee? Good morning, Joe. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you, Lee. So introduce yourself and your company. Sure. I'm Lee Sauls. Uh, My firm is Sales Architects, and I'm a sales management strategist. So you may be saying, what's a sales management strategist? I work with executives when they look at the opportunity in their industry and they say, you know what? We're not getting our fair share, and I don't know why. And so I help them develop the strategy, process, systems, and tools to, as I've trademarked, win more deals at the prices you want. Right. And you've written a lot of books. How many books have you written now? Sell Difference number six. (laughs) Very nice. Very nice. So when we were prepping, before we hit record, I asked about sales training. He said, I'm not a sales trainer. I do a lot of other stuff, but I'm not a sales trainer. And why don't you explain that? So sales training is is such an extremely important important part of a sales organization. And I have so much respect for my friends in that space that do sales training. You know, they're the ones that come in and reinforce a strategy that's already in place. The problem is that so often executives have this image in their head. I'm going to bring in a sales trainer. That person's going to come in for three days and then magic's going to happen. Right. Right. And what's missing is the reinforcement piece. So, for example, it doesn't matter what religion you are, go to church, go to temple, whatever it is. And while you're sitting there, you say, boy, I'm going to do things differently. Right. And no less than an hour later after you've left, you're back doing the same thing you were before, right? Because there's no reinforcement. Right. And so, you know, when, when organizations reach out to me, they don't know what a sales management strategist is. A lot of times the conversation starts off with, we need sales training. Well, what are you hoping sales training is going to do for you? And they have this image in their head, three days and triple the sales. It's not going to happen. Right. So the conversation we have is, what strategy have you documented? Have you laid out for your salespeople? How have you defined, for example, discovery? So important in the sale. Everyone says, yeah, we got to do a great job in discovery. How have you prescribed it? How have you laid out? how to handle discovery for your company. You know what they say, Joe? (laughs) Right. Right. Was I supposed to do that? Yeah. So one of my experiences is I did go back to school and I got my master's degree in education geared towards consulting and training. They called it performance technology and something else. I forgot what it was. But anyway, uh, it was in my 30s when I got that degree. And I remember... Initially, I thought I was going there for, to learn training. And one of the things that I learned at University of Michigan, and by the way, I was in my 30s, so I had already had some experiences, was that, that we were skipping what's the problem and moving right to the solution. So if I called and said, Lee, I need you to come and do training, you say, is, is training the problem? Are, they not, are the people at the is your sales team not following the strategy you developed? And they go, well, what? <laughs> what strategy, right? <laughs> yeah. And so remember the professor saying, guys, there's tons of work in this space, but not a lot of jobs. So you're going to have to start your own businesses. And I remember him saying, don't get into the business. If you can't do the diagnosis, don't get in. Don't, don't agree to come in and do sales training. Right. And it's like a, it's like a silver bullet. And here, by the way, I'll say this. This is, this is the story I've told many times. Lee, you work for me. I'm the sales manager. You're the sales trainee. And you're not having the success that you want. And you're not having the success that I want. I don't want to let you go. So I tell the boss, I want Lee to get trained. And the boss goes, oh, okay. Aren't you in the enlightened manager? And then Lee goes home, tells the, tells the wife or girlfriend, they really love me there. They're getting me trained. And by doing this, I don't have to admit I'm a crap manager. I don't have to admit that I don't know what to tell Lee. I don't have to tell my boss that the problem is our compensation. I don't have to tell the boss that our our message is wrong. I don't have to tell the boss that we have no recognition in the market. 
All of it is Lee's fault because he's 23 years old and doesn't know what to do. It's not my fault, not the boss's fault. I don't want to go and tell the boss he's wrong. I don't want to tell the boss that I'm wrong. It's beautiful. Sales training is the beautiful silver bullet. And I always say, and then when I bring somebody in, I'm jealous of them because they're doing something I can't do. I compete with that guy. Sales training is fraught with problems. And by the way, that, that I've had lots of sales trainers on my podcast, wonderful people. And what they will always say, you have to align that message from the top to the bottom. You, the CEO, the vice president of sales, the sales manager, and all the salespeople have to be on the same page. And I think that's a little bit about what you do. It is. And you know, when you talk about performance issues, I break it into two categories. It's very simple. If salespeople aren't meeting expectations, it's for one of two reasons, insubordination or incompetence, right? If you, incompetence means you've asked them to do something, they don't know how to do it. Insubordination is you ask them to do something, they know how to do it, and for whatever reason, they've elected not to do it. And from a troubleshooting perspective, the resolution is going to be very different. So, for example, you, you know, we hear um, insubordination, and all of a sudden we think it's a punitive thing. Well, it could be that they have too much on their plate. Right. Right. So, for example, um, employees not putting information in the CRM. Is it because they don't know how? So often we neglect that. We assume everybody knows where to put the data, or is it that they've elected not to do it? And so you can see the resolution is going to be very different based on that. So when I work with sales leaders, I, I break two very simple and understand buckets. If you have underperformance, you've got to figure out which of the two it is because that drives the resolution plan for it. Right. And, and I will say this. I, I, I can say this because I've said it a hundred times over the years to people. Your salespeople are failing because of you. That's you, your fault. You, you're not giving them what they, either you don't have a niche, either you don't have the right messaging. You're not communicating to them what they need to do or they're, to your point, they're, they're not following that direction. And so often we, in this business, transportation, logistics, 3PL, you hire 10 guys, usually 10 guys and gals, usually young, and then you just have them bang the phones and... Eight out of 10, nine out of 10 are gone in a year, it's gone in six months. Just doesn't work out. It's very expensive to do it that way. It's very common though. That's a very expensive failure model. Yep. So Lee, let's talk a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you got started writing books and advising companies. So my accent probably gives it away. I, I live in a suburb of Minneapolis today, but I'm not from here. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Lived in Staten Island for a while and spent my teen years in Marlboro, New Jersey, central New Jersey. And uh, from there, went to college in upstate New York, who was then called SUNY Binghamton, now called Binghamton University, and then had career time in upstate New York and Syracuse, in the D.C. metro area. And then I've been in Minnesota now for almost 20 years. Very nice. I, I was just in Minnesota for the first time. and Did you lose a bet? <laughs> no, I'm from <laughs> but. One of my, um, my my executive coach and someone I've worked closely with, she's been on my podcast many times, Ann Holm, she's a Michigander like me, okay. and she moved up there, and she always said, you know, you think Michigan's cold. We have one month more winter up here, and it's colder. And I was like, no, oh, it can't be. It is. It's colder there. <laughs> it's We're getting four inches of snow today. How about you? Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be like 55 here. So it's funny, though, when I got up there, I was, I was working with a company so I probably went up there f five times. And uh, what I learned was, people would say this, you grow up here, you say, I don't like it, it's too cold, it's this, it's that. And then they leave and he goes, and then you come back. And he goes, there's something. And, and I will say, I really enjoyed the people up there. And there's reason people stay there. Yes. And I was and I was kidding when I said about losing a bet. Right. Recruiters say it's the toughest place to get people to move to and the toughest to get people to move from. I mean, a buddy of mine said he's an executive search guy. And he said, he goes, Minnesota is hard. He goes, unless you find someone who's from there, he goes, then they're always willing to go back. He goes, almost no matter what you go. Yeah. I was, I was just listening to a book, uh, stories that stick. And that gal's in New York city. And she talks about moving back to Minnesota anyway. So when and why did you start 
uh, sales architecture. So sales architects, I formed right after yeah, leaving. I'm sorry, sales architects. I'm sorry. Sure, right after uh, the employment world. One of the things I discovered about myself ver- very early on was I loved creating strategy, process systems, tools, tip sheets for my sales teams. The creative part of the job really got me fired up. So if you mentioned a recruiting buddy. So recruiters want to call you, say, hey, I've got this great opportunity. They had someone who was doing a great job. They've moved on. They got promoted, whatever that might be. And they're looking for someone to continue what they were doing. And I'd say, great, I'm not your guy. Tell me it's never been done. Tell me it's a turnaround. Tell me the place is a mess. I'm in. And what I learned about myself at a very young age was when the creative part of the job was done, so was I. So uh, three years, once the creative part, I was ready to hire my replacement, which perfect for consulting, right? When the creative part of the job is done, you're passing the baton to the client and then you move on to, to the next gig. And so that's that's something that just fits so well with my personality. So I knew at a young age, I wanted to do consulting. And I also knew at a very young age that I wanted to write a book around sales. And you wrote six. And I'm signing a contract this week for number seven. <laughs> Excellent. I will say that, you know, the, the line between order and chaos is uh, logistics. And there's some quote like that. I probably botched it, but I noticed early in my career that I'm an automotive guy and I, we always develop processes and software and we make sure that we have these great processes. And what I realized is I love creating processes and I love following them for a short time. And then I think, I don't want to follow my damn processes. I want to do something else (laughs) because that's when it's no longer, as soon as you kind of wrestle the beast down and say, now it's just managing the process and you go, I'm bored. (laughs) But when the role becomes strictly execution, there are some wonderful, wonderful people that at that that say, "Okay, I got the playbook. I'm going to go make it happen." And those different are personalities, people. different yeah. personalities are good at different places. And and I will also say, like in automotive, we did it right. Is that and you got an automotive, you always had carryover products, so you're making tweaks, right? You're not. You just, they don't give you the. They don't give you the opportunity to screw up anything big. Wrong way to say that, but you are a. a a big fish in a little pond when you're on carryover products. Right. And then at some point you've got the, uh, the newer products. Anyway, let's switch gears and let's talk about sell different, which is the name of your last book. So oh, you mean this one, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so what is the subtitle on that? Sell different. What's it say? Right. Below? All new sales differentiation strategies to outsmart, outmaneuver and outsell the competition. That's what we all want. That's what we all want. <laughs> Amen. So, why did you write this book? Well, what was the inspiration? So this is the second one in a series around this sales differentiation theme. Well, what's that all about? So when you when I first talk with executives the subject to differentiation, their minds always go to the same place, marketing. And they're not wrong. They're just limited in their beliefs. If you think of what marketing does, marketing is one directional communication for the masses. It says, hey, look at me. We're here. Right, that's what a website does. That's you know a trade show booth. It lays out all the potential of right. what could be in the relationship. The piece that so many executives miss out on is that there is a role for sales to play in what I call sales differentiation. And sales differentiation takes all the potential of what could be and narrows it down to what should be for this individual in this circumstance. And there's two sides to sales differentiation differentiating what you sell and how you sell. And we're all so focused on differentiating the widget, the service, the technology, the what you sell side of the equation. Not enough focus on how you sell. Right. Or the title of the book, Sell Different. Yep. And looking at that side, and I'll tell you, that side of the equation is so much more powerful than differentiating what you sell. Because if you think about the what you sell side, you may have something that stands out today. Chances are someone's able to copy it. Oh my God, that is so, in in business, logistics and transportation, that is so true because we're selling to shippers, people who move freight a lot of times. And 
I remember when I was at a little 3PL, we had a wonderful software, a transportation management system, and that was relatively new. And when we would show that to people, they were blown away. They're like, oh my God, I want that. And we would do auditing, we do a different processes, right? And I remember being going to meeting after meeting where people just loved it. They didn't necessarily buy from us, but that was, they're blown away. Then I was in a meeting, it was a few years after I'd started there and guy came in late, said, I know I said I was going to give you a half hour. I'm giving you 15 minutes. And then we started to quickly go through our stuff. And he said, to stop, he goes, do you do the following? And he ticked off our service offering in like one paragraph. And we're like, and it was like, well, yeah, we do that. But, uh, I, and I wanted to say so much more. And I remember walking in the parking lot with the owner of the company. I said, damn, it's the market kind of caught up with us. So we really felt like we were way out in front in that, but the market always reacts. And if there's something great, like a brand new in visibility is one of those things in our business yep. where, where all of a sudden the visibility was like brand new. And then, then three weeks later, everybody and their brother saying our visibility solution. And I joke about this 50 people in a row wanted to talk about visibility on my podcast. And I was like, at some point, it stops mattering that you have visibility. <laughs> it becomes commodity, right? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, I, just, I, joke, I joke about it. There's a spectrum. So one is way over here on the low end of it. And then there's somebody else on the far end of it. If you're on the far end of it, make sure everybody knows you're on the far end of it. It's trying to really make the point that we're not just the, the on the low end of the spectrum. But anyway. You know, you know, I'm smiling, Joe. I went through the same thing when I was in the employment screening industry. We developed this technology to manage workplace drug testing for companies. The industry had never seen anything like it before. We'd, <laughs> we'd walk into prospects' offices. They'd take one look at this and go, here's the check. I mean, it was it didn't exist anywhere for six months. And you're a genius. <laughs> and the, right. And then the word got out that people really wanted this. And guess what? All of a sudden, everybody had an online management system. You talked about visibility. Clients wanted visibility into the drug testing. Everybody had it seemingly overnight. And you you went from hero to zero. <laughs> no, we had to keep reinventing ourselves. <laughs> exactly. If you don't, you go from hero to zero. to zero. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it, it, it is a little bit of a challenge in, in the transportation logistics space as more and more technologies come in to be able to kind of compete with that. And I think it really means we do have to go back and look at our product and look how we're selling it and to your our, how we're marketing it and to your point, how we sell it. So talk a little bit about how we sell. What it, what would be a different way to sell these things? How you sell. Exactly. So uh, I'll give you an example. So my older son, Stephen, when he was in high school, high school junior, my wife and I said, hey, Stephen, you need to set up college visits. And he was a little slow in doing so. I come to find out a lot of high school kids a little slow setting up those college tours. And at the end of his junior year of high school, he was asked to play on our city's American Legion baseball team. Very nice. And during a one-week tournament, Joe, he hit four home runs and three doubles. No longer were we asking him to set up college <laughs> visits. The colleges were coming to us. And if you've ever been through a college recruiting experience before, you know it's a sale. These coaches are trying to sell you on their institution. But they can't differentiate what they're selling. A coach can't add a major, build a dorm. Right. Move the campus. They can't even change the meal plan. It just is. Right. What they can do and have to do to attract top talent is sell different. Create an experience so that when they're talking to these top players, they say, you know what? I want to play for this school. Now, you know, when you first go to visit a college campus, as soon as you cross onto the border, onto the campus, your blood pressure jumps about 30 points. <laughs> you know why that is, Joe? It's not the tuition. You can't find a place to park. Right. Every parking lot on a college <laughs> campus says, park here and we're going to tow you, but welcome to our fine institution. Right. Well, this one school we visited, we pull into the parking lot and there's a spot with Stephen's name on it. Stopped us dead in our tracks. We go inside. There's an agenda for the day, Stephen's name printed right at the top. What did it cost that university to do those two things? Right. A penny. For the paper and the ink. But think about how they made us feel. They made us feel like Stephen was the only athlete they were recruiting. Anywhere on the planet, 
for any sport that they offered. Of course, that wasn't the case, but that's how they made us feel. They developed that experience. Absolutely. That, and to your point, it didn't cost them a lot to develop it. I was listening to a football player. I'm a big Michigan football fan, University of Michigan. And this guy said he's from Florida. So he gets recruited by everybody. And he ultimately came to Michigan and he said, well, the reason I end up at Michigan is he says, I knew I wanted to get an education. And he said, but when you're as a good football player, he said, people think all you want to do is get to the NFL. And he goes, I wanted that too. And he said, I went on a number of t campus tours and he said, and a lot of times he goes, they take you, they drive by, that's the library. That's the, that's the academic center. And they take you to the, 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 uh, facilities and go, here's, here's where your locker's at. Here's the football field. Here's the stadium you'll be cheered on. And then off to the frat party. And he said, when I went to U of M, University of Michigan, he said, they drove me straight to the academic center, talked about the program. He goes, and it was just the opposite. He said, they showed us the facilities, but they kind of made the point, you're going to have to be an athlete if you're going to, you're going to have to be a student if you get here. And he goes, of course, what did my mom and dad say? That's where you're going. <laughs> That's the place. And it was yeah. just inverting it. Yeah. And, and he said, you know, I still, still, he goes, all those places would expect you to go to class. Although maybe not all of them. <laughs> I don't want to give too much credit to some schools. Right. But he said, they made it clear to my parents that this was part of the experiences was getting a great education. And we talked to people who were on the team who were getting degrees and got in and they talked about, you know, your, your path. And all they did is flip it upside down, just like your son, just a little tweak. Yeah, I should mention, we were talking about this when you said baseball is religion in your family. You have two sons playing college ball right now, right? I do. Yep. One is uh, right now in Arizona playing 10 games. He's the uh, starting third baseman for Augsburg University. And my younger son, David, is a freshman pitcher at Concordia St. Paul University. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so um, let's switch gears here again. So. So how, so you mentioned your son's experience. How might I like, let's just talk about transportation logistics for a minute. Yeah. Let's just say I'm a freight broker and, and I get trucks for you and that's my main business. I work with carriers. I get them good loads. I work with shippers. I connect them with great carriers. I have technology that I bought. Yep. I'm going to change that. It's, it's simple. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk about the application of that story. Every salesperson, it doesn't matter what you sell, has the opportunity to make people feel special. And we forget, we may talk with 5, 10, 15, 20, maybe even more prospects and clients on any given day. But how many did they have with our company that day? One. For us, it's just another conversation. It's just another meeting. It's just another presentation. It's just another proposal. We forget to make people feel special. We've all heard that sales is a numbers game, and I partially subscribe to that. I love numbers. I love stats and metrics and all that, but I only partially subscribe because if you fully subscribe to that, you treat people like a number, and no one wants to be treated like a number. Right. We all want to feel special. One of the biggest fears that prospects have is they're going to join your company, sign on as a client, and they're going to get lost in the masses. We come in talking about how big we are. We've got thousands and thousands of clients and we do X number of these and Y number of those. And we think it's impressive and partially it is. But the worry they have, the fear they have, is that they're going to get lost in the masses. And when they talk with you, you won't even remember them. They'll call your client service department. They won't know anything about what you've talked about. They'll just be a number. And if you want to do so, forget about what you're selling. It just is. But when you look at the buying experience opportunity you have, you have an opportunity to make people feel special. And I'm going to share with you a question, something for you all to think about. Go back to your companies and talk about. For every touch point and every interaction you have with a prospect or client, ask yourselves these, this question. What is it that I can do different than the competition that my buyer would find meaningful? It's not different for the sake of different. I mean, if I showed up today wearing a pink outfit and a funny hat, it's it would different. be different. <laughs> really not meaningful to the listeners, Joe, right? So meaningfully different. And you will be amazed 
as you start thinking about that, how many opportunities you have that you're not taking advantage of today. You'll notice I haven't talked at all about the service that you're selling. I'm talking 100% about the buying experience. And you look at that continuum in the very beginning of the first time you're reaching out all the way through when they sign on and then when they're a client with you. What is it that you can do different, your competition is not doing it, that they would find meaningful? And meaningfully different is the key when we talk about the buying experience. So how important is differentiating, or I should say getting a market segment and really focusing on that? Is that part of this? Certainly. I mean, you the better you understand the market segment, by the way, Joe, you know, there was a study done in logistics. How much companies in the United States spent on logistics in 2021? And I know that number. I, I researched this prior to our interview. Do you know that number? No. How much companies I'm in guessing. The US spent? So, 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 ask the question one more time. How much companies in the United States spent on logistics, logistics and transportation in 2021? As a percentage or as a, a overall number? Dollar amount. I think it's eight hundred billion on like transportation stuff. But what do you? What was the number you saw? Zero. Companies don't buy anything. People do. And when you talk ah, about market segments, that's a good point. Yes. Right. When you talk about market segments, it's the people within that market segment and understanding each one of them. What keeps them up at night that you can address, and how can you address it? The better you understand the people that you're selling to and the nuances in those market segments, the better you can connect with them, the better you can make them feel special around what you're selling. Yep. And there's a guy, Jim Beerfeld, who'll be on my podcast soon again. He uh, has always been a logistics marketer. He has a logistics marketing company. And he does some shipper surveys every few years. And he just got done with it. And last time he was on talking about it, he said, when you talk to these shippers, they say, I get a million phone calls. If you're if you're shipping millions of dollars, everybody in the transportation business knows it. Those guys are on their on their weekend, they say they see a truck pulling into an industrial park, they follow it, see where it's dropping off so they can call those guys. With the internet, they're using all the all the all the capabilities to find these guys. But he said, when they call, they often don't know my business. And they don't know my problems. And I feel right. like I'm just a number name, another name on that list. They have to make 100 phone calls or 50 phone calls that day. And they don't know anything about me or my problems or my industry. And they kind of come at me with the same kind of lame line. So, Joe, what's a title that your audience normally calls into around logistics? A logistics manager? Or what's the title? Well, it depends on what you're selling. Some so like a lot like when I was selling, I would be calling like owner, CEO, because my record of CEO, maybe vice president, general manager, and because I recognize that logistics touched the sales guys, it touched finance, it touched the owner, right? So that was where I was at. A lot of people will be calling at the bottom and more transactional stuff, calling the guy on the dock, maybe, or maybe the shipping manager. So but my own feeling was always the same. I got to start at the top and I got to sell everybody on down <laughs> because if the boss says yes, but the guy at the bottom says no, guess what? You're losing that deal. <laughs> well, and, and part of that is understanding who in that spectrum of, of people will perceive the most meaningful value in what you offer. Right. And the owner may or may not be the right person. It may be someone else. Oh yeah. Sometimes they quickly put it. And you know, there, there's another piece to it with sometimes where you say, Hi, I'm Joe Lynch, and I represent blah blah blah. We, we help logistics or whatever you're saying, and they yeah. go, "Oh, talk to talk to Lee. He's in charge of shipping." And that and your spiel about other technologies you're bringing, other like I said, talk to Lee. He's the shipping manager, or Lee's the ops man, or whatever. And they're like, as soon as they hear hear what you say, bam, they send you. <laughs> Joe, let me give you two scenarios. Salesperson A calls a shipping manager and says, hey, I'm with ABC Logistics. We work with shipping managers to help the logistical process. Okay? Salesperson B says, I just read an interview with your CEO talking about an initiative to improve logistics, and that's something we work with shipping managers to address. Which one got the meeting, A or B? Yeah, it's got to be B. B. Joe. He's like, give me that article. Joe, who had the better product? 
Aha! Right. If you didn't believe in the power of sell different, I can't make it any clearer than this. Salesperson A had by far the better solution, but never got to the table because of how he sold. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've said this when we were prepping, a lot of times companies hire young people and they'll have 10 young people right at college. And they say, you need to make a hundred phone calls a day. It's a numbers game, blah, blah, blah. And I said, one of the challenges with that is yes, they're trying to figure out the message and they're learning from maybe the guy next to them. And they, they, maybe they went through some training, but I feel like sometimes that what you just described doesn't happen. And that really needs to happen more at the top of the house. And you say, look, we need, we need to have, and, and by the way, sometimes there's a real lack of alignment where the owner, if you heard the owner talk about what they sell, you're like, God, I want that. Then you hear the vice president talk about it. Maybe they're not as dynamic. Maybe they say something. And you go, yeah. It, the message gets lost. And, and then the larger the organization, the more likely at the bottom, there's no alignment to the message at the top. And so when you hear from the guy who just got out of school and he's unsure of himself and he's like, well, uh, Lee, the reason I'm calling today is because I want to save you money on your logistics costs. And maybe your last experience was I went with the cheap guy and they cost me even more than <laughs> they right. cost me. They almost cost me my job. Right. Right. The, the word that I use to describe what you just described is linear. Everyone needs to be on the same page from the CEO down to that entry level salesperson on what our value is and how to position it in a meaningful way. And I don't care how big or small your company is. If you don't have a documented playbook that prescribes this is how you sell, I assure you you're underperforming. Right. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, I've said this a few times and we're seeing it all the time now. Owners and CEOs are creating videos, they're going on podcasts and they're speaking directly to the market. And there's some real value in that because it's their vision it, and they and it, it's articulated in a way and they're passionate about it. And then I look and go, what's the difference in that guy who's 45 years old and started the company and loves this and eats, sleeps and drinks that and the guy who he hired a month ago who got trained by somebody who got hired eight weeks ago <laughs> and they're completely disconnected sometimes. That's the, they're missing that linear element you just talked about. And so sometimes when we just, we talked about in the beginning, I bring in this training or and say the, the problem is sales training. And you're saying training's great if, but you need that, you need that linear first. I need the, the message from the top to get to the bottom and then we'll do the training to align it to that. Joe, you remember back to high school science class, the uh, heated atoms workshop, so you Basically. take a Bunsen burner, <laughs> yep. you take a flask, and you would apply heat to water in the flask. Yes. And the atoms would go berserk. And then as soon as you took the heat away, what happened? The atoms returned back to a static state. That's what happens with sales training. We get the salespeople all excited while that sales trainer is there, but there isn't anything to continue the heat, to continue that energy if you don't have that playbook and that documentation and say, this is how you apply what you've learned and have a management team that's committed to helping it stick. Right. And and by the way, I've, I've probably facilitated 500 workshops over time. A lot of them cost savings, lean, all that kind of stuff. Sure. And the experience, and a lot of people will tell you this, we would go in and have an all day workshop and we would, and the energy's there. And everybody's engaged. Well, this is pre-cell phone before. And I, you, you can't let people bring their laptops in or they won't be engaged. But anyway, everybody's engaged. There's energy. There's, we're going to save $8 per car. Jeez, oh, Pete, we're all getting promoted. And then the next day I call, hey, uh, did you get those um, meeting notes out so we can uh, and start executing on that list? And, the, and this week goes, dude, I got back to my desk today and uh, the boss had sent me an email last night saying this is the top priority. I got to go to the plant. And by the way, I had 300 emails yesterday. The energy's lost, the moment's lost. And what 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 you identify in those workshops, if you got 10% of it to actually be realized, it was a miracle. It'd be much less than that. And I think sales training is that same thing. It's a We all went into the big conference room. We got this 
motivate. It was more motivational speaker almost where you're like, yes, we're going to win. Ah, run back to your desk. Oh my God. I got, I got so much work to do. I got to get back to work. Joe, Home do you know the name Herman? <laughs> you know the name Herman Ebbinghaus? No. So he created, he was a researcher in the late 1800s. He created what's called the forgetting curve. You ever heard of that? No, but I'm pretty good at it. And it's still valid <laughs> today. It says that people forget half of what they learned within 24 hours and remember less than 10% a week later. And there's that study has so many applications in the sales world. You talk about sales training. You know, we say, well, we got to tell them this. We got to tell them that. How about what do we want them to remember? That's the better question that we need to ask ourselves and, and getting it to stick. It's such an important part. I mean, I've told several organizations over the years who talked about sales training and I said, save your money. You're, you're going to be very disappointed in the results. You're not ready for it. Yeah. You, it, you're not against it. You just want it applied when it's time, when there's a message, when there's a plan, as you said, when there's a blueprint for Guys, I'm going to tell you exactly what to say, exactly how to manage things that we're going to we're going to coach you up in a way that is aligned. And by the way, your boss is going to remind you, your boss's boss is going to remind you, top of the house is going to remind you. There's uh, you you call it linear, I call it alignment. Yep. Alignment of the same ideas from the top to the bottom. And by the way, again, the, one of the other problems with sales training, even if you learn some really great things, in that four hour, eight hour session, you go back and then your boss says something that is different than that. What are you going to do? You're going to do what the boss says. So, so you say, well, yeah, but I love, I learned from uh, Joe and Lee that we should do this, this, and this. And he goes, Joe and Lee, who? Oh, never mind. Screw, <laughs> screw those guys, right? You're, you're back to whatever the boss wants. And that's so often the training. I mean, and again, it doesn't have to be that way. And again, it, it, I'm a big advocate training. I went to school for that, for my master's, and I'm a believer, but it has to be applied correctly. Yes. And and to your point, we got to start, we got to start differently. So describe your process and how, let's just say you were to engage with, we'll, we'll use this as kind of a summary and wrap up for this. Yeah, let's sure. just say somebody listens, says, they call you and say, Lee, I heard you uh, on Joe Lynch's podcast. And by the way, Joe's brilliant. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure we will hear that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so are you, Lee. Help us. Things aren't good. We're not getting our fair share in the market. And by the way, what's happening in this market, Lee, is we're seeing big players are buying little players. And some people are bringing enormous resources to this party. And then we see the tech VC guys who are coming in with heavy marketing budgets and they're spending on stuff like podcasts and they're spending on a lot of marketing and a lot of sales momentum. So they call you and say, Lee, help me. What's, what's the process? So there are a couple of fun questions I enjoy asking executives. So let's say, for example, a company has 10 salespeople. And I'll ask that executive, if all 10 of your salespeople had a discovery meeting and they called you up and said, I just had a great discovery meeting. What would you know for sure, for certain, took place in that meeting? And Joe, you know, you know the most common answer to that? Hmm. Not a darn thing because they've never prescribed it. Everyone knows discovery is the foundation for the deal. You want to improve success rates at the end, do a better job in discovery, and we're leaving it arbitrary. We're just saying to the salespeople, yeah, you know, you got to have a discovery meeting. And if we're selling the same product, the same service, the same technology, why would we leave it to chance? Why would we let each one of those 10 people decide what success is? Makes no sense. Right. And then I, I would ask it them. It makes no sense to those people at the bottom either. It does not. Exactly. So they're all Googling discovery meeting. There you go. Then, you know, so we'll get into this conversation and I'll ask, let's say they were in a manufacturing environment. If you hired 10 people, would you let them manufacture the widget any which way they wanted? Of course they would. Well, why not? Well, we're going to keep making mistakes. Hard to get consistency. We're not going to perform at optimal levels. Then why are you doing it in sales? So what, what I do in my work with clients is I facilitate workshops to mine out their best practices because a lot of times most of the answers reside in the organization. I help to surface them and turn a best practice into a process that the entire organization can use and leverage and I put that together in a playbook that reads as if they've written it themselves. I use all their language. I, I, I'm often described as, and the reason for the name of my firm is sales architects, 
is I build the framework for salespeople to be successful, but I'm not going to give them scripts to memorize. That's not what I do. I help them to understand the strategy, what we're trying to accomplish. I'll give them some sample wording. But as soon as we take the personality and style out of it, we're going to fail. Because if if we don't need personality and style, well, let's just have robots. We don't need salespeople, right? So I put this framework together that helps them to be successful, but doesn't get into all of the finite pieces that says, and you must word it this exact way. Yeah, I love it because I think the problem I've experienced myself, and I've done some sales training, and I've done a lot of other sort of training is... And I've been p- part of all this training is you mentioned the forgetting curve. You mentioned that we talked about the lack of alignment. I, I need that playbook. I need to be able to sit down and go, okay, I'm going to open this up. And at some point I really need to own this. And by the way, I have a son-in-law who's in sales and he worked at a large organization in fin- financials. And I can tell when he's saying what he's learned because he he's, when he talks about stuff, this stuff, it's, it's been ingrained in him. And, and and by the way, he's made it his own. It's not it's not awkward, weird talking. He's made it his own and he's applying it over and over again. And when he leaves that job, he'll still have those ideas in his head. And that's what we want. That's not that's not forgetting. That's ingrained. Absolutely. So Lee, let's wrap this bad boy up. So how do, who's your sweet spot? Who do you work with? And how do we reach out and talk to Lee Saltz? So I primarily work with executives and it's across all different industries. The the common theme, as I mentioned earlier in our talk, is it's an executive who looks at the opportunity in the marketplace and says, we're not getting our fair share. And I don't know why. And so I work with those executives to develop the strategy, the process, the systems and the tools to be able to win more deals at the prices you want. That's, That's the commonality if you looked at my client base. We talked about my book this one sell different, yes. which yeah. would be a great read for your son-in-law. Yeah, right. If you go to selldifferentbook.com, you can download the first chapter to either read or listen to. Both are up there. And if you buy the book, doesn't matter where you where you buy it, Amazon, uh, uh, brick and mortar stores, go back to selldifferentbook.com and register for the video series that goes along with it. Anybody that buys the book will receive a, a video one a week for a year to help them implement what they've read. Very nice. Very nice. So what I'll do, Lee, is I'll put a link, any links you give me, and you've got six books already. So we'll put all link to all those books. Awesome. Thank you. Link, link to your LinkedIn profile, link to your website. Any other links you give me, I will put in the show notes. And guys, you can reach out to Lee through his website and uh, through all these other means. If you want him, you can find him. There you go. <laughs> Lee, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. This I really love your approach to helping companies sell more. Joe, thank you so much for having me on. This has been great fun. Yep. Thank you. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.